Well, good evening, everyone, again, and welcome to our time of midweek Bible study. Uh, to those of you who are gathered with us here in the church hall, it's really good to be back again together in person. And to the many of you I know who continue to watch these Bible studies uh, online on our YouTube channel, a very warm uh, welcome to you again this evening. We've been for a number of weeks looking at the book of Jude, and we're back there. I suppose this is the fifth visit this evening to the book of Jude, and we shall... Uh, in a moment or two, um, go to that and we'll read together. So if you turn your Bibles to the, the book of Jude. Now we've kept reading this over and over again uh, week by week. And I suppose there's other, there's other related scriptures we could read. Uh, but because it's a, maybe an unfamiliar letter of the New Testament, it is worth maybe keeping reading bits of it. I, I, I won't begin right at the start uh, tonight, except to say that we know Jude is urging his readers to contend for the faith, because there are those whom he believes in the church are contending against the historic Christian faith that Jesus and the apostles have handed down. And he, he hits back against the false teachers in the church using a variety of illustrations. And uh, maybe we'll begin reading at verse 5 uh, tonight and read through to verse 13. Uh, this is God's word. I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay with their, within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. And perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden wreaths at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear. The shepherds feeding themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn. Twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea. Casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. We end there in verse 13. And no God will bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together just now. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and praying that having read your word, you would give us understanding and insight into its truth and asking, Lord, that you will bless and guide in these uh, moments when we open the scriptures and ask that they would speak to our hearts and be of profit to us as they were to your people of old and be that which encourages and challenges and puts us on our guard and causes us to do as Jude urges us, the people of his day to do, to contend for the faith that's been handed down to them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you think that's really a Christian thing to say? Shouldn't you be more temperate in your language? Shouldn't you show more love? I wonder if Jude had anyone saying those kinds of things to him as he sought to challenge and to warn about the danger of false teachers entering the church. As we've already seen, and as we're going to see again tonight, Jude doesn't hold back when it comes to thoroughly denouncing those whom he says in verse 3 had crept in unnoticed into the church 
but who were ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. When we read what Jude says here, we might ask the question indeed, was he getting a bit carried away? Certainly today, you will hear those kind of rebukes if someone is thought within the life of the church to be speaking a bit too forthrightly, or maybe is becoming what seems a bit harsh in their criticism. Someone will stop them and ask them, do you really think that's a Christian thing to say? Do you really think that's the right attitude? Shouldn't you show more love? Well, I think there's an answer to that question, and the answer is this. It really depends on the context of exactly what is being said and to whom it is being said. Give me, I'll give you two examples. In Galatians 6 verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression or sin, you who are spiritual, listen, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. And that's a reminder, isn't it, that from time to time, Christians, believing people, will succumb to temptation. Sometimes they will do that in a public way that brings dishonor upon themselves, maybe even dishonor upon the church's witness. And what Paul is saying in Galatians 6 is, that's not a time simply to weigh in with harsh words of condemnation. It's so much more a time to seek that person's repentance, to seek to restore them to a faithful, obedient walk with the Lord. And Paul cautions us that if we seek to correct other people, at the same time we need to guard our own hearts, lest we also fall to a similar temptation. So Paul warns, don't be quick to be harsh, to be condemnatory, because sometimes what's really needed most is gentle restoring of someone who has fallen into sin. Once again, if we think about the issues that divide Christian denominations, there are issues of Christian doctrine that we sometimes say are secondary issues, where sincere Bible-believing Christians have come to differing conclusions and differing opinions. And therefore, where it's necessary to respect one another in brotherly love, even though we may disagree. It's not that those issues in themselves are unimportant, but sometimes they are issues that don't go right to the very heart of the gospel. So, for example, sincere evangelical Christians may hold differing views on the exact meaning of baptism and just who should receive baptism. Should it be only believers or should it be believers and their children? Again, there's the issue we've been thinking about for a number of Sunday mornings once again. The meaning of the book of Revelation. That whole area of prophecy. What are we to believe concerning the sequence of events that will lead to the end times and to the return of Christ? Again, a number of differing views. Thirdly, there are, amongst evangelicals, differing opinions upon the present ministry of God the Holy Spirit especially in the area of spiritual gifts. The question arises, are all of the New Testament gifts still operational in the church today, or have some of them, especially those that are supposed to bring new words or revelations from God, have they ceased since New Testament times? Those are issues upon which Christians should be free to debate and upon which individual Churches or denominations will want to defend their own understanding of Bible teaching. But those are not issues that should lead us to sharp and deep division. And certainly not to one Christian calling into question the reality of another Christian's faith. Because you don't believe the same thing about 
the end times or about the, the gifts of the Spirit or, 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 or the mode of baptism. They are issues upon which Christians may differ, but still at the same time be able to stand as one on the message of the gospel. Now, the issues that Jude is addressing do not fall into either of those two categories. They are not about secondary issues, but they're about the very integrity of the gospel message itself. The false teachers who come into the church in Jude's day were setting aside parts of the message that Jesus and the apostles had proclaimed so that they could push their own new trendy alternative ideas. Likewise, Jude was not challenging people who had fallen prey to temptation and had fallen into some particular sin from which they could be restored through repentance. Rather, he was dealing with people here who were deliberately teaching in the church an alternative morality. Teaching things that actually sought, he says, to pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Their teachings, he says, specifically denied the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's why Jude writes so forcefully to urge his readers to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The very credibility of the Christian faith was at stake. The apostolic gospel message was under attack, not from the outside, but from within. It wasn't a time for inaction. It wasn't a time to sit back and just hope the, the trouble could go away and we could sweep it under the carpet. It was time to confront it and to challenge it because ultimately people's souls were at stake. If they heard a false message that wasn't the true gospel, they would remain lost in their sin. Others who were, had come to faith in the true gospel could be diverted off into false teaching themselves. And thus we've been seeing here Jude muster a whole array of material. Most of it from the Bible. Some of it we saw last time from a couple of non-Bible books. But all of this to drive home forcefully his point that it was time for action. Time to alert folks to how serious a problem they were facing and what dangers were lurking within the life of their church. Now we're coming back tonight to, to verse 11 where we left off last time. Here he is comparing the false teachers to three different Old Testament characters. And then in verses 12 and 13 he uses an array of illustrations, we might call them word pictures, to highlight the dangers that those people posed. And to highlight the corruption that was within their hearts. And to show the judgment that God would bring upon them. So let's go again to verse 11. Let's think a little bit further about Jude's three Old, three Old Testament illustrations of the character of those who were disrupting church life and were undermining the gospel. The first we mentioned briefly last week, he was, it was Cain. In fact, this is, he's probably the most familiar of the, the three. Jude writes, woe to them because they walked in the way of Cain. If you remember last time we noted what Cain's fundamental sin was, really it was the sin of unbelief. We know the story of how he and his brother Abel were to bring sacrifices to God. Cain's sacrifice was considered not acceptable. And I think it's, when we read that in Genesis 4 in connection with Hebrews 11, it's clear that the, the real issue was that though Cain could do religion the same as Abel, the same as anybody else, he did not bring his sacrifices with a heart that truly believed and trusted God. And that the sin of unbelief manifested itself further just in the way that he behaved subsequently. The sense of jealousy that developed towards his brother. That jealousy that festered into resentment. Resentment that festered into hatred. And of course would ultimately lead to murder. But when God spoke to Cain warning him that sin, if he didn't get a grip on himself, would, would soon overtake his life with destructive consequences, Cain just wouldn't listen. And of course he ended up murdering his brother 
and they ended up falling under God's curse. So you see, for those who were influencing the church in Jude's day, he was saying, here are people who can make an impression because they talk the religious language. They come amongst you. They seem nice people, pleasant people, affable people. But be careful what's ultimate to discover what's really in their hearts. Because fundamentally, Jude is saying, in their hearts is a heart of unbelief. Unbelief in what God has spoken. And God has already said, authoritatively, through the apostles of Jesus Christ. And here are people who are not willing to be themselves corrected by God's word. That's the first illustration. Second illustration from the Old Testament about their behavior takes us to the book of Numbers. And to a character called Balaam. Now I don't know whether you remember Balaam's story well. Most of it is told in, in Numbers chapters 22 to 24. Balaam is hired as a prophet by Balak the king of Moab. Uh, because Balak has sensed that the uh, approaching Israelites who had remember travelled all the way through the wilderness and were coming near to the promised land. Uh, that he saw them as a threat. And he wanted this prophet to pronounce a curse upon the people of Israel. However, we are, are told about how Balaam uh, spoke to God about this matter. And, and God clearly told him he was no way to curse his own people, to curse the covenant people. And therefore we, we, we're told that uh, Balaam said back to, to Balak, the king of, Bo, of Moab, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, this is Numbers 22, verse 18, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God uh, to do less or more. And in all the stories of Balaam's attempts to curse Israel, we find in every occasion God intervenes, God actually turns the curses into blessings. And at the end of Numbers 24, we're told that it seems that Balaam just went away and went home again. But that's not actually the end of the story. The next chapter of Numbers, Numbers 25, tells a rather sad episode because it talks about the Israelites when they were in the land of Shittim, which is in Moab and they, on, the, on the, what would ultimately be the, the borders of the promised land. They began to whore with the daughters of Moab. So they entered into forbidden sexual relations with these pagan people. And they accepted the invitation of those women to uh, not only have relationships with them, but to take on board their gods, to sacrifice and to worship the false gods of Moab. And of course that's something, as you may imagine, that produced the Lord's anger against, against uh, the Israelites. But how did that happen? Well, later in Numbers, in chapter 31 and verse 16, we actually are told that the hand of Balaam was in it all. Balaam had failed in his attempts to curse God's people, but he still so very much wanted the money that had been promised and the riches that had been offered by Balak, the king of Moab. So when he failed to destroy Israel's uh, approach by pronouncing curses he actually managed to undermine Israel in a totally different way and it seems it was he who was behind uh, the whole idea that the woman of Moab should seduce the Israelite men and lead them into forbidden relationships lead them into pagan worship and so here was a man Balak who had talked to God who had heard plainly from God that what God's will was and that God did not want to, him to, to curse or to harm his people. And yet for the sake of personal gain, Balaam did everything he could behind backs to subvert God's will and indeed to bring harm on the people of Israel. And likewise, Judah's saying, the false teachers in the New Testament church, they were totally aware of what God's word taught. They were aware of what Jesus and the apostles had said. But for their 
out of their own lust for power and position and influence and money, they were led to to deliberately seek to undermine what Jesus and his apostles had taught. And of course, the money motive is ultimately a corrupting thing, isn't it, in so many areas of life. And it can be a corrupting thing when it enters into the life of the church. I mean, in, in totally different ways perhaps today. But you see the, uh, the, the wealth of the, pro, of the prosperity gospel people and the, the TV evangelist types who promote all of that. And it's not really, the prosperity gospel is not the gospel uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's a, a message surrounded by words and, uh, and language that sounds Christian, but of, ultimately is something quite different. Uh, and often money and influence and power and popularity are the things that are behind it. Jude is another example uh, from the Old Testament. This time it's from earlier in the book of Numbers. One of those occasions when in the wilderness, as they journeyed from Egypt, to the promised land and of course they spent 40 years in the wilderness many times or more than well several times the Israelites rebelled against the God's leaders against Moses and Aaron and then this occasion uh, in number 16 the rebellion is led the ringleader is a guy called Korah who is one of the Levites and Jude compares him to the false teachers in the church he says they perished in Korah's rebellion now of course at this stage quite clearly as Jude wrote the letter these people hadn't perished they weren't actually dead yet but he's saying to them he's saying be careful because these people are as good as dead because they're going to fall under the same judgment that God brought against Korah and those who rebelled against God's leaders in the Old Testament now the story is this you see that in number 16 that Korah and some of the Levites decided, you know, why should Moses and Aaron have authority to to be our leaders? Sure, we could do as absolutely as good a job as they did, as they do. And they came to Moses and they said, Moses, you have gone too far. All the congregation are holy, every one of them. Why should we take leadership and authority from you? Why do you exalt yourselves, was the actual words they said, above the assembly of the Lord? But of course, the issue was that Moses and Aaron were put where they were by God. And it wasn't the place of Korah and his friends to take over as leaders. They had a role to play. They were Levites. They were called to be those who would serve in the tabernacle and so on. But they weren't called to be the leaders. And of course, the the whole thing turned out like this. Moses said, well, we'll let God decide. Let's see what happens tomorrow. If you come and, and, and seek to offer sacrifice, and of course the next day, uh, Moses and, and or sorry, Korah and his friends turn up. They're ready to offer incense, and there's a bit of a showdown with Moses. And to try to cut a long story short, what happens is this: that the Bible says, quite frankly, that, that the ground opened, and the ground swallowed up Korah and his family. And 250 others who had joined with him in rebellion were told fire came out from the Lord and swallowed them and destroyed them. Pretty terrifying act of judgment. You don't get an act of judgment like that any day of the week. But Jude's saying, well, that's exactly what's where these people are headed. These people who have come into the New Testament church and said, you know, why, why should we... Why should we give any heed to the authority of these guys that call themselves apostles? I mean, we, we've got some new ideas. Things have moved on. You know, the, 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 it's time for something new. That's old hat. The stuff that, you know, Jesus and the apostles handed down. We've got new insights. We believe, you know, we have something new to say to the church. And Judas saying, well, you may think that, but that's exactly what Korah and his friends thought. Why should we listen to the leaders God has appointed when we could do it, do just as well ourselves and down comes the judgment of God upon them. These people who were teaching in the New Testament church were denying Christ and they were enemies of God. No matter what religious labels they used, no matter what religious language they employed. And so 
Jude then <laughs> really rips them apart in the next couple of verses in a whole series of little illustrations that are very powerful in their own way. Uh, and the first of them is this, if you look at verse 12, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. If you're reading the NIV, it would probably say these are blemishes at your love feasts, is another way of translating the, the words. Uh, what does he mean? Well, here he's focusing in on this thing that, that these people are in the church, but you can't always spot them. You see, they turn up at all the, the church meetings. The love feast uh, in the New Testament church was, uh, well, there was some similarity to what we would call communion today because it was, it was a fellowship meal. People gathered in the early church for a meal. They shared food together, and the, obviously mainly in house churches in those days. And in the midst of that meal, they would take the bread and they would take the wine. They would remember the Lord's death and so on. They would also take time to pray, maybe to hear from the scriptures, maybe to hear a message from the scriptures. The love feast was a, a, a fellowship time and a worship time, but maybe more informal than we would be used to. But he was saying into that lovely time of fellowship, here are these people, and he says, they are like hidden reefs. You know what a reef is? It's a outcrop of rock or of coral or whatever, and it's below the water line. What happens when you sail your boat over the top of it? rips the bottom of the boat open and the next thing you're beginning to sink and he's saying that's the danger these people pose when they've been within the church uh, you don't see immediately all that they're up to but be sure with this they're trying to undermine and ultimately to sink and destroy the witness that has gone before the faithful witness of the gospel they're destructive he also says they are shepherds feeding themselves and what's a shepherd meant to do who's he meant to feed sheep all right they're meant to feed themselves and of course if you remember back to the old testament the book of ezekiel uh, one of the judgments that god brings there like through ezekiel uh, against some of the leaders of of the the jews back in those days was that they were like shepherds who who just looked out for themselves and didn't care about the people. Ezekiel said, Ezekiel 34 verse 2, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? And this was the issue here uh, with the, 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 those who had entered into the church, the church in, in Jude's day. They convinced everybody that they were, you know, they were plausible people. They were maybe even said, you know, you, you could think of us as an elder, you know, you could think of us as your next pastor. They looked like they were plausible leaders, but in actual fact, what they really were feeding was their own ego, their own lust for power and self-importance. And they were wanting again to uh, undermine uh, the, the, the word of God and, and do anything indeed that would prevent the people being fed from the scriptures. Next illustration, they are like waterless clouds swept along by winds. Now, uh, sometimes we have plenty of experience of clouds in our own country. We've had plenty of experience of them today, and there's been no shortage of water. That's not the case in parts of the Middle East. Uh, parts of, uh, of the Middle East, and not least the Holy Land, uh, would, be, would be areas that sometimes are pretty dry and hot at, cer at certain seasons of the year. And water's in a short supply. And so when you see a cloud coming along, you might be wishing, well, I really could do with a shower of rain here to help the crop grow. Well, but if the, crowd, if, the, if the cloud comes over and all it does is bring darkness to the, to the eclipse the sun, but doesn't actually produce rain, it is, all it's done is give you a kind of dull, miserable day, but absolutely no benefit flowing from it. And he's saying that's what these people have really brought into your church life. They've cast a shadow over it. But they've certainly not done anything uh, to, 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 to uh, bring the water of nourishment to the people of God. Nothing that will give life, but in fact, that which will sap life from the church. Fourth illustration, he says, they are like fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead and uprooted. Again, it's great if you have a fruit tree in your garden. If you're an apple tree or at this time of year, 
Uh, you probably have blossom on it. Certainly, you've seen the cherry blossom and so on already. It's, it's wonderful if, uh, to see uh, trees and flower. But ultimately, what you're really looking for is the fruit later in the season. But if the, if the tree doesn't produce fruit, it's it's not of any use. And of course, remember there's there's the endless illustrations in Jesus' ministry where he comes upon the fruitless fig tree and he he pronounces a curse upon it because it hasn't produced what it ought to have produced. And uh, that that which which doesn't produce fruit ultimately you know is to be cut down and thrown in the fire. It's only good for firewood. It's not good again for providing any anything nourishing anything good anything that's a blessing uh and so on by way of food and he's saying this is what these people are like in the in the church they ultimately do not produce spiritual fruit in themselves or in anyone else and then he says this they are twice dead uprooted that's the judgment that's upon them isn't it because remember what 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 do we mean by twice dead well we know what death is but we know also from the Bible what the second death is. What's the second death? It's hell, isn't it? Those who, who suffer the second death, according to the book of Revelation, are those who ultimately fall under the judgment of God in hell. And he says that's really where these people are headed. That, that, that's that's, that's their, their destiny. And then it says also then, they are wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Again, in, in ancient times, much more than today, the stars were vitally important for navigation today. Of course, you have GPS and satellites and all these things. Navigation's easy, but in, in former times, uh, the fixed points of the stars and the heavens and so on, depending where they were at certain times of year, were essential for navigation. You needed the pole star, knowing that's where, that's where north was and so on, uh, as you navigated on a, a ship. But however, if, if what you had was a shooting star that just flew, flew across the sky and fizzled out that was no use and likewise sometimes the planets uh, you know as you as you know at times there's times in the in the sky you can see the planet venus or the planet mars and so on they and they look like a star but they do not follow the sort of say because they're moving and so on in an orbit around the sun they're they're, they're not really of the use for navigation that they that the rest of the stars are anyway that's the idea behind this these people are like wandering stars they're not going to lead you anywhere that's any use. They'll just lead you to your lost. That's really what they're saying. These people will, in, will ensure that, that, that people are lost. That's all that their ministry will produce. But he says, ultimately, it's they who are lost. For them, the gloom of outer darkness, utter darkness has been reserved forever. Also, interestingly, of course, one of the descriptions in the Bible of Satan uh, and his origins is, is, is a star that has fallen and is ultimately brought down to, to final judgment. And he says, that's what you've got there in those who have come uh, plausibly into the life of the church. You've got people there who ultimately don't lead people to know Jesus, to know the Lord, to know salvation, to know eternal life. They simply lead people to continue in their lostness or indeed they, they divert people who, who know the Lord into a byway and a, 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 a place of backsliding a, a, and spiritual compromise that is ultimately no good and is, it fall, is under the judgment of God. But that's what they themselves are under. Jude's, Jude's so powerful about this. These people that come into your church, they're not people you want to make friends with. They're not people who just need gently restored because they've kind of fallen along the way. They're not people who, who you just want to have say, well, we, well, well, we'll agree to disagree on that point. We maybe have had two differing opinions. We'll just agree to disagree. These are people who have deliberately sought to undermine the gospel. These are people who are to be rooted out and challenged. And these are people who ultimately are under the judgment of God. Well, we'll leave it there for tonight. Hopefully that's some help again in understanding Jude. And uh, at this point, we'll uh, draw to a conclusion for those who are watching the video with a little word of prayer. And then those of us who remain here in the, in the hall will have our own uh, time of prayer together. Let's pray once more. Lord, we see that uh, the scriptures all through from Old Testament into the New warn us of those that Satan raises up to undermine the faithful message of God's word to God's people. And 
how subtle sometimes are, is their influence, how appealing and plausible uh, they can be in the way they present themselves, unless God's people are on their guard, and unless we guard our hearts, and unless we stay close to the word of God. We're praying, Lord, you'll give us that spirit of faithfulness in our hearts day and daily, to be those who search the scriptures and who heed the word of the scriptures and who are not easily deceived by those who proclaim a message that is in contradiction to your revealed word in Holy Scripture, the word you've given to your prophets and your apostles of old, the word you've spoken supremely in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to remain faithful to you and be in our guard against the evil one. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, the rest of us who remain here will continue with a time of prayer.